Department of Wildlife Conservation, Outdoor Oklahoma. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. I'm today with Mike Sams, our private lands biologist for the state. And, and Mike, it's kind of a uh, blustery day, kind of a little damp, and it's got me thinking about hunting season a bunch. <laughs> sure, it's a great day. <laughs> you bet. Now, as you travel the state and visit with private landowners, you no doubt probably have a lot of them or a certain percentage that um, ask about information about food plots. I'd say just about all landowners that I speak with mention food plots in some fashion. Okay. And right. which requires some education on my part is to let them know what food plots are good for and what they won't achieve. Okay. Well, you know, as a hunter, I typically think of a food plot as being um, a, a tool that I can use to help concentrate the, the deer or the turkey or whatever wildlife that I'm targeting into a uh, predictable area during hunting season. Right. And, and many landowners, that's what their goal is, is to use those food plots as attractive, concentrate movement, being able to see and harvest deer a little bit easier. Right. Well, you mentioned, though, that there are maybe some shortcomings with food plots, too. What are those? Uh, the shortcomings are the perception of what, a, what food plots can do for you, mm -hmm. the perception of bigger, better, better bucks, mm -hmm. uh, a lot more animals. Uh, science just hasn't bared that out that that's going to do much for you. You really need to treat that habitat as a whole, not just a small portion of that. Okay. And how we treat that habitat is various means. Uh, right. Primarily, uh, prescribed burning and grazing are your two primary ones, but then timber, brush control, uh, in some instances, brush planting. It kind of okay. depends on the region of the state we're talking about. Well, if you're a landowner or a leasing that's interested in food plots, and that's the stage of the game you're in in your management plan, then today's show is going to be a special treat because we're going to be visiting with a couple of our biologists from our wildlife division as they share the ins and outs of food plots in Oklahoma. Hello, I'm Jerry Shaw, and I'm a wildlife research technician for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Today I've got the special privilege of showing around a little bit on a local landowner we have here in Oklahoma as we talk about food plots. Um, as you can see from the signs behind me, our landowner here has been gracious enough to come in and let us take a look. He also realizes the value of partnerships with other agencies. Just as uh, today we're going to try to help you guys learn a little bit more about food plots, um, our landowner has used some of these different organizations back here to help improve his property. It's a really fantastic place. Hopefully I'll learn a little bit as I come around on it today, and hopefully you can learn a bit too. Come on, let's go take a look. Well, one of the questions that I get often um, in my office is, what shape do I need to make food plots and how big do I need to make them? Well, that kind of depends on, number one, the equipment that you have available. Of course, if you don't have equipment available, your size is going to be pretty limited unless you already have a field prepared. Um, in a case like this where you do have some equipment available and you can pretty much do what you wish, um, size is just a matter of how much you're willing to put into, into a food plot and how much you're willing to spend in time and, and actual money and, and expense. Um, one thing to think about when you're conducting a food plot is most of the creatures that you're going to want to attract are actually creatures of the edge, meaning they like a transition zone between habitat types. In this case, you've got the habitat of the food plot juxtaposed up against the habitat of the timber and the, and the grassland behind us. Um, another thing to think of whenever you're conducting a food plot or, or laying out a food plot is the shape of the food plot. In this food plot, you can see that we've maximized the edge by taking and making an irregular border. It's not just a big square. In other words, we've kind of tried to follow the contour of the land, we've tucked it into some trees in some areas, um, and we've made it alongside this road so we can actually get equipment in there fairly easily. Um, one benefit of having these little ins and outs and fingers and inlets in a food plot is it gives a chance for the animals to feel safe and secure. Um, for example, if the, if the turkey's behind me, 
rent a wide open food plot, they wouldn't feel secure enough in me standing here. However, because they're able to be so close to cover, um, they're not quite as alarmed as normally they would be. Um, so here we've got a pretty good example of, of the benefits that you can get from a food plot. Number one, we've got a supplemental food source available for these birds, and perhaps most important for us as, uh, as wildlife watchers and wildlife hunters, is it gets these birds out into an area where we can actually observe them, and if the season was right, we might actually even be able to uh, set up here and try to call one of these birds in in the spring. Basically, I got involved as a result of enjoying the outdoors and enjoying hunting and fishing and then buying a ranch where I could do that. So the impetus, number one, was enjoying the outdoors, finding a retreat to do that, buying the ranch, and then starting the de development of that ranch into a uh, wildlife you know, refuge, but more or less a, you know, a fishing game area that's, that's very heavily managed. I am only a steward for a very, very short time. And as a stewardship of that property, that's what I am. I really retain, basically, my ownership is only stewardship. It's gonna pass for me in not too many years. So while I have the property, I want to be the best steward I can be. I envision the property as what it is today, and I envision it a lot better five years from now because it is a ongoing process. You never arrive in, in, uh, at Nirvana, as they say. You never arrive there. It's an ongoing, always a journey, and I'm journeying towards what I consider the best possible, which will always get better because it will never be done. Basically, there are two kinds of food plots that we deal with here in Oklahoma. We've got a warm season food plot and then a cool season food plot. Um, the kind of food plot you, uh, you want to put in depends on what your goals are. Uh, these summer food plots are, are really beneficial for the deer. The problem with the summer plot is in years when the deer really need them, they're tough to grow. In other words, we don't have the water available. If there's plenty of water, then the native forages are going to take over and the deer are going to key in on those. If it's a stressful period um, where there's not a whole lot of water, it's really difficult to get some of these food plots to grow. So that's, that's one thing that we have to consider with a summer food plot. The other food plot, or a winter food plot, cool season food plot, is one that typically hunters are more familiar with. It's these food plots that a, that a man will plan or a woman will plan on their property in order to help attract deer. Um, you're really not going to increase the carrying capacity on your property or the number of, of animals that the area will support with a plot this size. But what you can do is you can bring deer out where you can see them and you can bring them out where you can harvest them. Uh, this is beneficial to hunters in that it increases opportunity to not only see deer, but perhaps you can be a little bit more selective. Uh, you're able to look over several deer. You can tell if that's truly the deer that you're wanting to take or if that's one that maybe you should pass on and let grow another season. Some good cool season uh, plants that we see here in Oklahoma used quite a bit are winter wheat, um, marshall ryegrass, ryegrasses, um, peas, any, any kind of legume that you can, that you can get started. And one thing that a legume has the ability to do is actually pull nitrogen from the soil. There's a bacteria that's associated with their roots that enables them to pull the nitrogen out and make it in a usable form for the plant. Uh, again, nitrogen is one of those nutrients that, that all plants need, but they need it in different amounts. And an important thing to remember is your soil will provide these nutrients in different amounts. Uh, the most important thing that, that you can do before you spend the time, effort, and money to, uh, to go and produce one of these food plots is just take an afternoon, get soil samples, box them up, and take them to your uh, county extension agent. Have them analyze it. They'll give you information as far as what nutrients you're lacking, if you're pH, if you're acidic soil, if you're basic. Um, they'll tell you the things you need to do to correct that. Uh, have some idea what you're going to plant when you go talk to them. Perhaps the plants you're wanting to put in requires a little bit more alkaline soil. They'll be able to tell you how to adjust for that. But it's basically a shot in the dark if you don't take the time to do some of this analysis on your property. Um, I could go out and I could buy all the seed and plant it out here, and if I don't have that soil test to tell me what it is that I need to make this grow to its optimum, basically I'm just spinning my wheels and wasting my time. Well, uh, food plots are a magnet for wildlife. And our whole goal is to not only attract wildlife, but to keep wildlife. As a result, we have an abundance of wildlife. I recall some years ago, when I purchased the property, Russ and I were out trying to find a turkey. We couldn't find a turkey 
We couldn't even hear a turkey during you know, the spring turkey season. So we were concerned in, about how to enhance that for turkey because that's one of the hardest uh, aspects of wildlife to get on your property if you don't already have them. So as a result of implementing the plans that the Oklahoma Wildlife Department, the Ag Department through the Forest Stewardship Program and all the plans we've implemented, we started getting turkey. And now we have an abundance of turkey. And the food plots are instrumental in that because without our food plots, we wouldn't retain it. The turkey and the game would pass through us, but we don't want this to pass through us. We want them to stay there. So we are now, you know, a magnet. We are the grocery store. Uh, a management area has to provide uh, the habitat for the animals, for them to stay. And that is like going to the grocery store. As long as you have food and you have shelter, the animals are going to stay there. And as long as you don't overproduce, I mean over harvest, not overproduce, but over harvest and take care of the animals, then they're going to reside on your place. And that's what has happened at Niles Canyon Ranch. And we're very, very happy about that. And we're continuing to implement all the time programs to continue that process. I'm Russ Horton, wildlife biologist with Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Today we've been talking about food plots. Uh, the reason that we've got this shot, I'd like to show you an overview of the place that we've been looking at. Uh, you look, we're looking at just uh, miles and miles of old red cedar choke canyon. The neat thing about this place is our landowner, he hasn't tried to turn it into something that it's not. He hasn't come in and cleared these steep shallow soil uh, slopes to try to plant some type of grass or he hadn't tried to convert it to agriculture, but rather he's dedicated this entire property to wildlife and wildlife management, which is without question what it's best suited for. One thing to remember when you're choosing a location for your food plot is you're gonna wanna put it in a spot that already has pretty good habitat. It's not gonna do any good to go out in the middle of a Bermuda pasture and put in a food plot. Sure, you might get some usage, but anything that's going to be in there is probably going to be there in the middle of the night. So what you want to do is find a spot that's got good native habitat, such as we have behind us. We've got some sand plum, we've got a good grass meadow, and then we've got some good escape cover just on the other side of that. So this is kind of an ideal spot to put in a food plot. You've got good native vegetation, you've got escape cover nearby, and then you also have a good spot that you can maybe supplement their diet a little bit. Another question I get asked a lot is, do I need to buy the commercial product food plots? You see them advertised in magazines and on television. You know, they're promising big racks, more deer, heavier deer, and they might be able to produce those. But you don't have to buy that commercial product. You can go to your seed co-op or your seed producer and kind of explain what it is you're looking for that you want to do a wildlife plot, whether it's a cool season plot or a warm season plot, and visit with them a little bit, and they can offer some suggestions, and they can make you a customized blend. And again, a blend is going to be beneficial because if you put more than one seed type down at a time, basically what you're doing is you're hedging your bet. Perhaps the wheat might not make, but if you mix wheat in combination with Austrian winter peas, perhaps the peas might make. Um, again, with the winter peas, they have the ability to produce nitrogen, which can also be beneficial in that it frees up nitrogen for the wheat. So you don't necessarily have to go into the store and buy something off the shelf as a food plot. Granted, those could be the right uh, right cure for your situation. That might be exactly what you want. And it's convenient, it's handy, and it's already packaged. If that's the way you want to go, that's fantastic. If you choose to go another way, you can go to your seed supplier and actually have them custom blend you a mix specifically for your property. We've talked a little bit about field shape and size, and here you can see this field's got some nice undulating edges. Again, that gives the animals a place that they can feel a little bit more secure, that they can just step around the corner and be out of sight. One other thing to notice about this area, other than the myriad of deer tracks that are completely covering it, is how it's kind of patchy. As we're out here more in the open, um, where we're getting lots of sunlight, we've got a nice green crop coming up. Um, we've got some good wheat coming up in here. But as we move on further, closer to some, some cedar trees that are here in front of me, those cedar trees are high enough that they're actually shading out part of the food plot. And a lot of people don't think about this when they're actually putting in their food plots, but you need to make the plots big enough so that they're not going to be shaded out by trees around them. In the smaller areas, that can be a real problem, especially with real thick, dense trees such as these uh, cedar trees behind us. But you want to make sure that you're going to get plenty of sunlight exposure actually on the ground. Other things you have to watch out for is as you get closer to your field edges, you're going to have less and less water available. 
the native vegetation that's outside your field is going to be taking up water at the same time that your plants that you're planting are trying to take up water. So kind of have that idea in mind when you're planting on field size, that the edges probably aren't going to produce near as well as that out in the middle. In addition to uh, whitetail that are going to benefit from your food plot, you can also get added bonus uh, by getting uses out of wild turkeys, as we see over my shoulder here. Um, also, bob white quail can often be found, if not in the food plot, actually eating, um, associated with the edge and cover produced just right at the edge of your food plots. So in addition to whitetails, you can also maximize your opportunity for seeing wildlife um, with species that maybe you hadn't intended uh, when you planted your food plot, but they'll also use it just as, a, as an added bonus. But you don't have to have farming equipment to put in these food plots. A guy with a rake and a little bit of ingenuity and some time on his hands can put in a fantastic food plot. It doesn't have to be something that's this involved. In recent years, we've seen more and more four-wheelers being purchased by sportsmen. These are fantastic tools for putting in food plots. You don't have to go out and necessarily buy the equipment that drags behind it. Although they make discs and harrows and broadcast spreaders, you can pretty much do that on your own if you just take a little bit of time and ingenuity. Um, I know, for example, one gentleman that uses a piece of railroad track with two chains to help plane his field to help clear it out. Once he goes through with that, he'll come back with a broadcast spreader, broadcast his seed and fertilizer as his uh, county agent uh, suggested he should. And then to cover his seed bed up, he's got a piece of chain link fence that he drags behind his four-wheeler. Simply, it all fits in the back of his truck. When it's not in use, putting in food plots, he can use it to work his cattle. He can use it to keep an eye on his farm. All different uses for those four-wheelers. But that's an excellent tool that you guys have uh, at your disposal. A food pl plot doesn't necessarily have to be a commercial seed mix or even a mix that you plant. Behind me here, you see an area that basically, when this property was purchased, looked just like what we see in the background, was nothing more than a cedar thicket. Uh, came in with a bulldozer and cleared all these cedars out, turned this into a large opening, and you see a tremendous growth, not only of native uh, grasses, but forbs as well. There's good nesting cover, good escape cover, lots of good food. Uh, you see the plum thickets coming in, some nice uh, escape cover and loafing cover for species like quail. But just within a hand's reach of where I'm standing here, I could probably pick up 15 or 20 different uh, plant species. There's, there's forbs, there's, there's, there's grasses, a lot, lot of cool season coming in. So when you think of a food plot, you don't necessarily have to think of go out and plow and plant something like an agricultural field. You can provide habitat and food both just by manipulating your native vegetation. And in a lot of cases, which is what we see here, uh, plant succession has turned what was once a good opening into a, a thicket. And a lot of places here in Oklahoma, that thicket is dominated by these eastern red cedars. Um, now that you've got this opening, um, it's easy to maintain it with something like as, as simple as a prescribed fire. A uh, periodic fire every two to three, maybe four year rotation in this stuff will keep a lot of this small woody stuff that would try to encroach and take this opening away or convert it back to a thicket again. Just an occasional periodic fire when conditions are right is all that you need and that, that also stimulates good growth of these native plants. These food plots are not going to be the cure-all. They're not a magic bullet. They're one tool, but they're a tool that needs to be used in combination with other factors. If you don't do proper population management and doe harvest and make sure that your buck to doe ratios are in balance, and if you don't take care of the native habitat that you have, no amount of food plot that you could ever put in will make up for those deficiencies. So make sure that you got the, the priority straight where you've got habitat manipulation taken care of and you've also got your population manipulation taken care of before you start on something as intensive as a food plot. Other drawbacks to think of or any time you concentrate animals in an area unnaturally, and that's basically what you're doing with these food plots. You're pulling in animals from the surrounding areas and piling them all into one spot where they're all interacting. That's gonna upset the natural balance somewhat. You're gonna have some social friction between groups of deer. You're gonna have some social frictions between does and the younger deer. And later in the year, you're gonna have some friction between bucks and does as the rut starts to come on. Also, if you've got a summer plot and you're concentrating does in one area with a lot of fawns, you can increase predation. Coyotes will very quickly hone in on these food plots, not only to find mice, but also while they're looking for mice in these plots, they can come across fawns that are easier to catch in the spring. Again, disease is something that you might think about. 
if you're concentrating deer in a big area, particularly if you have an artificial feeder that's spreading corn or something of that nature, anytime you concentrate those deer, you're increasing the potential for spread of disease from one animal to another. Another important aspect about locating your food plots is proximity to road. One of the main reasons that we ask you to try to avoid putting a food plot next to a road, if at all possible, is that it just serves an attraction for people that might want to poach or trespass. So the more, the more you can put your food plots back away from county roads or public roads, the better off you are. If due to space restraints or just the soil types that you have to use on your area, you do have to put a food plot next to a road, I would suggest you do something like this landowner's done here. He's come in, it's a triple row, tree row. It's perfect screening cover. It's graduated. He's got some deciduous trees that are going to lose their leaves. But his last row here, you'll notice, is evergreens. These are going to stay green all year long. And no matter if it's spring, summer, or winter, you're not going to be able to see into his area. And the less you can see, the safer your animals are. We well, you know Mike, Jerry, and Russ certainly shared a lot of information there about food plots. And it's probably no wonder that landowners can sometimes feel overwhelmed when they're trying to improve their habitat. But the good news is that they're not in it alone. No, that's true. Uh, we've got biologist technicians scattered throughout the state, and we provide technical assistance free of charge to anybody who would like to improve their habitat for wildlife. Very good. So there, there's lots of advice that landowners can get. What about uh, helping me uh, kind of pay for it maybe a little bit? Too? Well, there, there's those opportunities as well. There's, good. there's a number of programs out there, both on the federal side and the state side, including our own wildlife habitat improvement program that okay. provides some cost share and in some situations incentives to landowners to create better habitat on their place. Okay, you mentioned in the beginning of the show some of those very specific things that can be done. What are some of those maybe those cost share options that are out there for landowners? There's a lot of cost shares that deal primarily with with a permanent type improvement for for okay. habitat. Uh, we want a 10-year lifespan. So a food plot like we saw today, mm -hmm. uh, it's basically only good for one year. So it's okay. not applicable. Okay. But stuff like thinning forest, uh, planting trees, uh, fencing off riparian areas, mm -hmm. uh, that type of information, including putting in those well-needed fire guards right. and doing some sure. prescribed burns, that's also cost shared. Well, very good. Well, there's lots of advice and lots of help. You know, the neat thing is, though, as we help landowners with their, their projects on their property, we're helping all of us because, you know, the majority of Oklahoma is privately owned. So when we help a private landowner, we're helping to improve habitat for everyone across the state. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. We'll see you somewhere new next time in outdoor Oklahoma.